A tidal wave of anti-government protests is gathering pace as it spreads across North Africa and the Middle East. Libya joined the Club of Unrest on Wednesday, and demonstrators are promising more to come. We can now cross live to Tel Aviv to get the latest from our correspondent, Paula Salir, who was standing by. Hello to you, Paula. So, um, President Mubarak, or should we say former President Mubarak, toppled in Egypt. Now the leaders of neighboring countries, who some of whom have also been in power for decades, they're also in trouble, aren't they? Well, they certainly are. We're witnessing a tidal wave of demonstrations taking place across the Middle East. The latest to come on board is Libya. Overnight Tuesday in the city of Benghazi, several hundred protesters and some estimates suggesting as many as 2,000 people took to the streets. They clashed with police, protesters throwing stones, police responding with rubber bullets, tear gas and water cannons. Now, there is a call that has gone out for massive demonstrations to take place in Libya tomorrow and the protesters are organizing themselves with Twitter and Facebook and other social media. And this is what we're witnessing also in Morocco, where the call has gone out for massive demonstrations to take place this Sunday, February the 20th. Now, the protests are against the king, who is a popular figure, but what people are calling for is that his role be reduced to come some kind of ceremonial role and that democracy be introduced into the country. Algeria is also planning protests in the coming few days, here too, using social media, which is the inspiration that follows from those Egyptian demonstrations. Now, for the sixth consecutive day, we're witnessing demonstrations taking place in Yemen. We're being told that as many as 2,000 people took to the streets. They clashed with police. They are against President Ali Abdallah Saleh, who has been in power for more than 32 years, and they're also concerned about poverty, unemployment, and corruption. In Bahrain, the protests there continuing today, thousands of people took place in a peaceful funeral procession that was to bury one of the people who was killed in demonstrations there on Monday. Human rights groups are accusing the security forces in Bahrain of using pellet guns at short range. Now, the king has vowed to investigate these claims and institute reforms. And then lastly, in Iran, it too is witnessing demonstrations. Thousands of people clashed with police in a funeral procession there for protesters also killed on Monday. We're also hearing from government officials and clerics. They are calling for the trial and execution of opposition leaders who they claim are behind these demonstrations. So, Paula, Morocco, Iran, Bahrain, Libya, Yemen, Egypt, we're just seeing a tsunami of unrest uh, spreading across the region there. Uh, let, let's step back for a moment and look at the broader picture. The Middle East, strategically, it's vital for the U.S., which is also heavily engaged, as we know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. How is Washington going to push its agenda in light of the latest regional events? Washington, as you can well imagine, is increasingly concerned. If we look at just some of these countries, Yemen is an important American ally. Bahrain is an important American ally. I mean, if we look at a place like Bahrain, there the United States houses the headquarters of the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet. The, the big question mark for Washington, of course, is Iran, because it does not have a strong American influence there. In these clashes that happened uh, today, Wednesday, a lot of protesters were holding up anti-U.S signs, they were, they were chanting anti-American slogans, and the feeling is growing within Iran, as it has been for some time, against the, the American administration. If we look back at what inspired a lot of these events, the, the toppling, if one can call it that, of President Mubarak in Egypt, the United States was giving conflicting messages, very confusing messages that people here in the region were receiving. At the beginning of the demonstrations, it seemed to support Mubarak, who the U.S. had supported for 30 years. It then slowly changed its support to the demonstrators, and by the time Mubarak was overthrown, it clearly put itself with the demonstrators. But people here are asking the question, this doesn't really change the U.S. influence, particularly in Egypt, because now the army is in place, and for, for years, the U.S. has been financing with billions of dollars the Egyptian army. So to some extent, the army is really just the other side of Mubarak's power. So the U.S. watching these developments with increasing concern and needing to balance itself, people here criticizing, A, American involvement, and B, that involvement involvement as being of double standards. And then, of course, Israel comes to the party, Israel watching events, Israel increasingly concerned that it could see Islamic republics erupting on its borders. Israel, of course, had a peace treaty with Egypt. It's concerned whether or not that will continue. So as the tsunami continues to sweep across the Middle East, the U.S. and Israel as well increasingly alarmed. All right, Artis Polis Lear, live in Tel Aviv. Thank you.
while author and researcher Adrian Salbucci says that Washington's trying to promote its own model of democracy in the region so as to keep the people under control. Clearly, the United States will support anything that will promote what they normally call regime change in Iran, especially considering that Iran is such a powerful country from the point of view not only of its potential uh, military and also its potential with oil, but also its potential as being a theocracy where in the Islamic world, uh, the Ajatollahs based in Tehran hold great sway over literally hundreds of millions of Muslims. So whatever happens in Iran is far more important than even what happened with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. We have to understand that what the United States now, I believe, is trying to achieve is a way to promote change in a way that will facilitate things for them. The best instrument that they have to control the country is so-called democracy, because although they call it democracy, it is basically a vote count counting system handled by the mass media. Where you, the, the guy who wins, whether it be a president or a prime minister or a senator or, or a deputy, is the, the, the one counted with all the support of the money power, whether it be for his campaign or for media uh, and, 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 and TV time and so forth. So, for example, in a country like Argentina, democracy is the best way they have to control the country against the people's interests. And I think that when I hear that they are promoting democracy in Egypt, I tremble for the Egyptians, because if it's going to be a democracy along the brand as it was promoted in Argentina or, 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 or elsewhere throughout Latin America, it will only help to support the long-term objectives of this global power structure operating from Europe and from the United States and not the actual interest of we the people to say it in a, in a very colloquial and generalized manner.